I'm Gilbert Cruz, editor of the New York Times Book Review, and this is the Book Review Podcast. It's the 400th anniversary of the publication of Shakespeare's first folio, which gathered, in 1623 for the first time, several dozen of the Bard's plays all in one place. The British Library and the publisher Rizzoli have just released a quite large and beautiful edition of that first folio. This week, Sarah Lyle, who was last year on the podcast speaking with Zadie Smith about her novel The Fraud, is in conversation with Adrian Edwards, head of the Printed Heritage Collections at the British Library in London. Sarah and Adrian talk about what the heck a folio even is, that famous portrait of Shakespeare, and some of the particular delights of the British Library. Let's turn now to that conversation. I'm Sarah Lyle with the New York Times Book Review podcast, and I'm delighted today to have Adrian Edwards, a rare books librarian at the British Library, with me today. We'll be talking about Shakespeare's first folio, which is celebrating its 400th birthday this year and has been reprinted in facsimile by the British Library, and we can all buy it. And Adrian, if you could start off by telling me what is the first folio and why is it so important? Hello, Sarah. Hello. Well, the first (laughs) folio is a collected edition of the plays of William Shakespeare. It's a very large volume. Most copies contain around 909 pages, that sort of number. And it contains 36 plays written or co-written by William Shakespeare. And it's important because half of those plays, 18 of those plays, had never been printed before. And the other half had been printed, but not necessarily with the texts that are included in the first folio. So this is the first time that all of, essentially all of the plays that we know and love by William Shakespeare are published side by side in one authoritative edition. And the book was published 400 years ago today after Shakespeare had died. So tell me how it came about. What happened to get this thing in motion and how difficult was it at the time to pull off something like this? Well, it would have been a major endeavour to produce this edition. It's, it came about several years after Shakespeare had died. Maybe, well, we don't know when they started working on it, but it was published seven years after his death as you say, in in the autumn, the fall of 1623. It was produced by a syndicate or a consortium, a group of people working together. At the heart of that group, perhaps, we think, directing the project, were two people called John Hemmings and Henry Condell. They were the last surviving members of the acting troupe that Shakespeare had worked for, an acting troupe that originally had been called the Lord Chamberlain's Men, but later became known as the King's, the King's Men, the King's Company. Do we know why they took it upon themselves to produce this? Did they feel that they needed to do this because they understood the historical importance of Shakespeare at the time? Were they doing it for posterity? Was it for personal gain? What was their their reason? Well, I I, I don't think we know. Neither of them left any diaries or any notes or any correspondence, unfortunately. But it looks like people were definitely unsure whether the correct versions of the plays would survive. The versions of the plays that were being printed as small pocket-sized editions were often not, clearly not right. They contained adaptations, they contained mishearings, misprintings and so forth. And as I say, some of the plays hadn't been printed at all. So uh, the, the conjecture amongst most academics is this was done for posterity primarily, that this was the last chance really, while there were still some people around who knew those plays and could vouch for their own authenticity. I have to say, there were plays being printed at this point, but under the name of William Shakespeare, that were not written by Shakespeare at all. His name was just being reused for, for other works. So there were, I think there must have been a lot of concern. Hemings and Condell, they're really, I think, reading the introduction that they write, that they publish inside the first folio, they are c- keen to put right the, the bastardized versions of the, the plays that are doing the rounds. And they know what they should be. They, they acted on stage with Shakespeare. They were there when Shakespeare was writing these plays. 
That's amazing. But yet it was still probably very hard to definitively say that these were exactly what they were meant to be, right? There were different versions, as you say, knocking around. Some things had been published, some hadn't been published. Were they working off Shakespeare's own written accounts of these plays? Did they, in some cases, have to make judgments about what the correct word was or what the correct speech was? And the follow-up question to that would be, so how can we see these as definitive ourselves? Is this the best we have at this point? Well, in terms of sources, lots of scholarship has gone on over the last um, century or so. And I think a consensus has been reached that, that we've got a mixture of different sources here. We've got the earlier quarto editions, these these pocket-sized single-play editions, which is the text of those are sometimes being used, perhaps edited lightly and then republished. So that would be true of a play like Much Ado About Nothing. There are then manuscript copies now lost, perhaps fair copies, nicely written out copies that might have been in the archives of the acting company. There are theatrical prompt books now lost for plays like Julius Caesar that seem to be being used. I think it's possible that some of the sources they had were some of the scripts written out by Shakespeare himself. There's a suggestion that maybe that Antony and Cleopatra was typeset from one of Shakespeare's own drafts, perhaps. But I think most of the plays are going to be a mixture of all of these things, and they're going to rely very heavily on the memory of uh, John Hemmings and Henry Condell. But at the core of one of the things you just asked is this idea that there is a definitive version. And I think some researchers today would argue that maybe there wasn't. Maybe the plays were more organic than that, that, that they were adjusted according to the venue where they were being performed, which actors were available, perhaps how much time was available to perform the play. Is that frustrating for Shakespeare scholars? I mean, one of the things when one studies Shakespeare in school is this pointillistic attention to each word. So, you know, we've all read the this study editions where there's a footnote next to every word and there's an, an explanation of exactly what Shakespeare meant. Are we now to think that some of that was just sort of they were winging it later when they, you know? Like, how, how do we look at both what you're saying is the as you say, organic performance of these plays, and then this notion that every word is a precious thing when it comes to Shakespeare, who is so precise in his language. Well, Shakespeare probably was very precise in his language, but others have definitely had their part to play subsequently. Even in the first folio, and we should talk about why that scene is authoritative, but even in the first folio, there are places where just a few places where the printers, the typesetters, the compositors have made changes in order to fit the text onto the amount of paper available. So I think one has to respect the work of editors of Shakespeare who are pulling together versions today from multiple sources and say, well, maybe that's probably closer to to what Shakespeare may have written than the first folio sometimes. But the first folio is the version that we are told is a definitive version. That's what Hemings and Condell tell us at the beginning. That's the implication of having a poem, well, two poems in the volume, in fact, by uh, his peer, Ben Johnson, the Poet Laureate. You're meant to come away with a sense that the version that you're, of the plays that you're seeing in the first folio are, is the definitive version as Shakespeare wrote it. I'm just suggesting that recent scholarship is perhaps saying maybe that needs to be nuanced a bit. Well, it's really interesting because the, when you don't know as much as you do, when if someone like me, there's always questions that seem to swirl around Shakespeare and there's still, I think, some body of argument that holds that he didn't write the plays or he didn't write all of them or even the ones that we think he wrote, maybe he didn't write them. Is that, is, are there some of the things you're talking about why we still have those questions? I mean, I think you've just said there are no plays left in his handwriting. 
So it's, it's so frustrating, right? How, do you feel like this answers these questions, the first folio, or does it add to the questions? It adds to the questions. So all the evidence we have creates this wonderful pool of evidence that I think researchers and performers and theatre directors will keep coming back to a time and time again, looking for new paths through the material that we have. So tell me about what's in here. So it's 36 plays, is that correct? And half of them had never been published at all before? That's right, yes. The way that publishing worked in in the 17th century and the late 16th century is very much less organised than it is today. And the playwright would not have had authorial rights in the way that an author does today. The rights to the plays would have remained pretty much with the acting company in theory. And then once they are pub- the play is published, the person who, the printer who last published it then has the rights. So there's 18 plays that had never been printed before. And the notion was to put these all together. Well, what are some of those plays? What would we have lost, do you think, if we hadn't, if we didn't have the first folio? Well, if we didn't have the first folio, given that all the manuscript versions of the plays are lost, we wouldn't have plays such as The Tempest or Twelfth Night or A Winter's Tale or Julius Caesar or Antony and Cleopatra or Macbeth. So there'd just be names. There'd just be names. People went to see them. People printed them. But we wouldn't know what the text of those plays was. Has anything been left out of the book that, in retrospect, should have been in it? Yes, that's a, a, an interesting question. There are several plays that aren't in, in the first folio. I suppose it depends how you judge what is Shakespeare, but certainly a, an obvious one that's missing is Pericles and two, two noble kinsmen. I suppose those are the two main ones. We know f- there are other plays where Shakespeare wasn't the playwright, but he contributed towards a version of the text. The main example of that is a play called Sir Thomas More, or the book of Sir Thomas More, which is a play that never got through the censors, written by somebody else, never got through the censors. And a range of playwrights were invited to have a go at rewriting bits of it so that it could get through the censor. Shakespeare was one of those playwrights, and he has rewritten a section of it. And that survives, and that's here at the British Library. And we're very lucky to have it because it's the longest piece of Shakespeare's writing that exists. It's just, I think it's three pages. And that is in his writing? And that's in his handwriting. Oh, that's exciting. So it's both both his creative writing and it's his handwriting. Well, more evidence of of his existence. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm sure there are some scholars that would want to take issue with some aspects of that, but that's the consensus. His creative writing, his handwriting. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This is the Book Review Podcast, and I'm Gilbert Cruz. Let's go back to Sarah and Adrian's conversation about Shakespeare's first folio. There were more than 700 copies of the first folio, and from what I understand, about 250 exist today. And you guys have five of them in the British Library. Obviously, other collectors, other institutions have them. Why is this folio better Why is the one that you have reprinted or done the facsimile of, in your opinion, the best one? Would the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, for example, argue that they have a better first folio? Oh, I'm sure the Folger would. The Folger have the largest collection of first folios anywhere. I'm not sure what number is, 80 something. And well, it depends how many, how, how you count them, but let's say 135 copies surviving is the number on the Folio 400 website, which has been set up for this uh, celebration year. Most of those copies are not complete. In actual fact, the number of complete copies of the first folio is probably closer to, I'm guessing here, but 40 or 50, something like that. Most copies of the first folio are missing preliminary pages. So it's pages at the beginning. There's 11 pages at the beginning that, that people get excited about. One of them being the title page with the portrait of of Shakespeare. 
tell us about that portrait for a moment. So it's one of the few portraits that we really think is him that survive. Is that right? Well, that's what we're told. Let's be honest, that's what we're told. Uh, whether that's right or not, um, we have to go back to your uh, your, your mythical uh, dinner party with Shakespeare present to ask him uh, and look at his face for real. So the portrait is produced by an artist engraver who's originally from Flanders called Martin Drusout. And there's no evidence that Drusout and Shakespeare actually met. Oh, really? So I just (laughs) put that into the mix. (laughs) But these two guys who knew Shakespeare, who put the book together, and Ben Johnson, who wrote those poems, they would have known what he looked like, right? They knew what he looked like, and they signed it off in effect. Okay. Both in very explicit terms, in fact. what The first of the two poems by Ben Johnson is is printed opposite the portrait and, and, and confirms, short poem, but it confirms that this is a true likeness of Shakespeare. So we are told that this is Shakespeare. But as with the text, there are more than one version of the portrait. So frustrating. <laughs> well, no, it's interesting. It's fascinating. Uh, it doesn't affect what he looks like. It's minor th- details, but they're interesting details, I think. It became a real issue, this issue of, of first folios without their portraits. So what you notice in some first folios is that there's, a, there's another state of the portrait where there's a loose hair that's been added to the profile, sort of up on his top left of his head, there's a loose hair. And it's not clear now, because there's been so much playing around with copies, it's not clear now what point this loose hair was added, whether some of the original first folios had it, or whether there's a second, a third, well, two thirds, and a fourth version of the first folio during the remainder of the 17th century and it's just the sort of thing people love coming to libraries to compare copies and of course they can do that here at the British Library because we've got five first folios. Are people allowed to come and actually look at them in the in a rare books room or something like that? I mean could I go see one in real life? They are available for consultation by researchers but <laughs> yeah, they're, they're very valuable and they are, in some cases, some of them are fragile. So we almost always successfully encourage the, uh, our researchers to work with facsimiles. How do you store books like that to keep them from falling apart? Where are they in the library and how often do people actually touch the real ones? Well, they're stored in different places. So one of the British Library copies is George III's. Another belonged to Thomas Grenville. And both of these collections are still all kept together in the centre of the British Library building in, in, in central London. There's a huge book tower and they're in there. I can't tell you where, but they're in there. When you walk into the library for people who haven't been there and they should, there's this amazing see-through, I don't know how to explain it, column in the very center of the library with all these beautiful old books in it. And from what I'm hearing, this is where this extraordinary collection of King George III was put after this li- the new library was built not so long ago. And it's really a beautiful way of making the those books part of the decoration of the library itself. Well, I'm glad you think it's lovely. I think it's very successful as well. I mean, British Library is a public building. So if any, anybody's uh, in London, please do come up to, to, to the British Library building and come in. There are free exhibition galleries always open and the space is just lovely anyway. So the last time I was in the British Library, I was just stopped by for something and I asked one of the people who work there, if I had, if I was like, if I had just time to see one thing, what would you suggest I go see? And he said, oh, well, Magna Carta. (laughs) And I wonder, when you go into that, the exhibition room, where I've I've been quite frequently, because there's such extraordinary works there, and you get a sense, obviously, that it's only scratching the surface of what you all have in your storage facilities. And I wonder, from your point of view, as a, someone who works there, what excites you most about these works? Is it the content? Is it the what the book actually is? Is it the printing history of it and how it fits into the, the how books were made in centuries past? Is it the beauty of the object? Is it the rarity? Like what, what excites you the most about a work that you work with? Oh, I suppose it could be any of those things really. But I do come from the point of uh, being particularly interested in the physical artifacts and how it was created, the technology behind it. My personal interest is in printing 
yeah, I, I'm interested in, in different printing technologies, the application of good printing, good page layout, good design, nice bindings, good illustration techniques. Those are the things that tend to catch my eye Ra- rather than the, the content, perhaps less often. There's a few places in New York where if I'm dropping by the Frick, for example, I always go and see the one particular painting that that really makes me happy. If you are feeling like you need to be cheered up or excited on a day, is there anything that you'll go and just sit next to and look at and take in? Oh, in the British Library? Yeah. I'm very interested in in George III's collection, which you've already talked about, but there are other storage areas where we've got collections, areas where I do a lot of work that I just love. And George III's collection is interesting, right? He was the same King George III that we in America fought a revolution against, right? The the one that you rebelled against. The ones we rebelled against, yes. That's him, yeah. So he was a book collector. As well as a tyrannical king (laughs) who oppressed the colonies. But he was a great book collector, right? And he had a Gutenberg Bible. He had a first folio. He had the Canterbury Tales, the first edition as well, right? Yeah, first and second, yeah. And how did those get to the library? The collection of George III is one person's lifetime collection, albeit through the agency of professional librarians. Frederick Augusta Barnard was his librarian for most of his life. When George III died in 1820, George IV inherited his father's collection, but it was in Buckingham House, and it was taking up valuable space. And what what is Buckingham out. House? Is that the same thing as the palace? Yes. So what he wanted to do was get rid of the books so that he could then remodel the building and turn it into Buckingham Palace. Mm. So, yes, he had to get rid of the books. And there are lots of stories around that. But essentially, he, he cut a deal with Parliament whereby he gave the books to the nation. And Parliament passed them on to the British Museum Library, which is our predecessor organisation for this part of the collection. And hence they came into our care in in, in 1823. And then when the new library was built not so long ago, that's when we had that beautiful column where you can see them. Yeah, Yeah, they were in public gallery spaces in the British Museum building. They moved there in 1828. They were there up until 98. And then we moved them up here to our new building and put them on display in a rather more successful way, I think. They're certainly stored in in much better environmental conditions. Just getting back to the folio, really basic question, what is a folio? This goes back to an old way of describing book sizes. It relates to the way that the volume is put together. So in a folio, you have a a sheet of paper and that the, the The issue here is that a sheet of paper doesn't have a standard size in the historical Mm. periods. So you have a sheet of paper, which might be in European speak, A3 size. I'm sorry, I can't remember what you call it in America. Double full scap kind of thing. And it's been folded in half so that you have, if you imagine, like a greetings card, so that you have two leaves and four pages. So that's the folio. It comes to signify a particular kind of prestigious or expensive book because you only use that amount of paper in that size of a volume for certain types of publication. So in the 17th century, you're primarily using it for things like Bibles, classical texts, perhaps legal texts. You're not using it for something that is considered at that time to be very throwaway and ephemeral, which is what a popular play would be seen as. And those would be printed in in quarto, is that correct? Can you explain the difference? So a quarto, if you imagine the same idea, you've got this big sheet of paper, which could be various sorts of sizes. You fold it once, then you fold it again. And it'll be half the size. Of, it'll be of... half the size, yeah. Most quartos are about the size to go into, well, we'd say pocket size in the, in, in the concept of, of a 17th century book, though now in the 21st century, most garments will not have pockets that large. But it's, yeah, it, it's something you can hold in your hand. So you a book that you can sit down and read, or you can stand up and read it by holding it in one hand and turning the pages. You couldn't do that with a folio. 
a folio you're going to need to put down somewhere. You could try and read it within on your lap, but that's probably going to be uncomfortable over a long period. If you are going to use it for reading, then you're probably going to put it on a table or if it, if you're consulting the Bible or, or in a church or, or, or whatever, or a, a classical text in a library, you're going to put it on a lectern of some sort. And that reinforces the notion that this was a serious undertaking. Yes. So this is a very interesting phenomenon that Shakespeare's plays are published in a folio volume. It's something that, in fact, hasn't been done before. So a few years before, Shakespeare's contemporary Ben Jonson has been involved in self, almost self-publishing a folio of Ben Jonson's works. That's a mixture of some plays and some poetry. And in fact, poetry, even English poetry, English language poetry, has appeared in folios before. What's unique about the Shakespeare first folio, or Shakespeare's folio, however you want to call it, is the fact that it is only plays. These plays would have been created by Shakespeare for the King's Men for performance on the stage by that one troop, they would have. The idea originally would have been they performed them for a number of runs in in London. They would have taken them on tour, and then the expectation is that they would have been forgotten. And the notion again, it seems like, is that these contemporaries of Shakespeare who'd w- worked with him realize the importance of these plays and realize the importance of gathering them together in a really making a historical volume. It sounds like they really were thinking of how he would be perceived later on. Yes, I think that's right. Well, well, somebody is thinking about this. Somebody is thinking, these plays are so good, they need to be preserved for posterity, and we need to elevate them somehow so that people understand that what they're reading, what they're seeing is something wonderful, something a cut above the rest. And they have decided that, that doing it within a folio volume an expensive folio volume, is the answer to that. Will you all be having a celebration to mark the 400th anniversary at the library? We're not really having a celebration as such. We have a small display that we put on in our treasures gallery you mentioned, where you can, if you're in London, come and have a look. We've we've actually put on display alongside each other all the editions of the first folio that came out in the 17th century all open to their title pages so you can see how this portrait of Shakespeare survived on its copper plates and carried on being used until, mysteriously, it's lost in the century <laughs> and we never see it again. Thank you so much, Adrian. This has been a really interesting conversation. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Sarah. That was Sarah Lyle talking to Adrian Edwards of the British Library about Shakespeare's first folio on this the 400th anniversary of its publication. I'm Gilbert Cruz, editor of the New York Times Book Review. Thank you for listening.